Okay, so mabuhay and welcome to the HR on the go. So top trends and hot topics relating to HR and the people management are coming your way. So buckle up and uh, prepare for takeoff. So uh, let me of course introduce uh, myself. No? I'm Jester, a, char a certificate, uh, certified professional in human resources. Now this is a joint um, collaboration of Clark HR Council and uh, a certified professional in human resources. No? So this is uh, going to be aired on the uh, CHRC every second and the uh, fourth week of Tuesday no? uh, monthly. So at least uh, you get to know when are you going to watch us live no, on Facebook. So again, this is a free um, online show no, available for viewers. You can also watch this on our YouTube account no, in partnership with uh, uh, Circological Group. Uh, just visit the YouTube account of Circological Group. So, um, wag na natin patagalin pa, of course. So, uh, to start, so our pilot episode for today is actually a very interesting topic. Now, this topic is actually, um, especially in trying times, no, is, is, uh, has brought down companies no, to its knees. Um, most of the organizations now are, are, are not just cutting down costs, but even um, uh, letting go of people since they're not able to support their organizations. Uh, in this time of pandemic. Now, as far as the uh, the uh, accounting rules are concerned, now the cost of employees um, uh, through compensation and benefits uh, is treated as an expense, so we all know that. And of course, most especially the finance and accounting department knows this, no? that uh, the cost of employees no, is treated as an expense no, on the income statement. That is why some of the organizations, as I've shared a while ago, have undergone, uh, um, undergone no, downsizing uh, because employees is one of the highest causes no, a company incurs. Seeing people uh, now as one of the uh, challenging areas um, in these trying times. So through, no, through this uh, episode, through this pilot episode with our guest for today, no, which I will introduce later. We are to learn and explore how we can develop employees from events no, to revenue drivers again through this pilot episode with, of course, our featured guest. Seen him on poster, you know, you say might be familiar no, with our featured guest, Mr. Ron Ona. So, Mr. Ron Ona is a performance strategist. Okay, so wait no more as I am now going to introduce you. No, the future guest for today's episode. Okay. Now, going through the uh, uh, profile, I yeah. will uh, welcome uh, Mr. Ron Ona um, later. No? So, let me introduce Mr. Ron Ona. So, Ron is an IT profession having a BS uh, computer science degree specializing in people, process, no? and technology integration, helping business improve innovate and grow. He spent most of his career life overseas and is now semi-retired you know, and back in his homeland, settled just at the edges of uh, Sierra Madre Mountains. You know? uh, while semi-retired, uh, Ron works remotely as Chief Innovation Officer of a UK-based company, Lead, uh, Lean Vision uh, Limited, and helps uh, support businesses, um, business improvement and IT projects across Europe and the Middle East. He also is the uh, managing partner of um, a local uh, job contracting firm, uh, Serendipity Multipurpose Cooperative, uh, employing 3,800 employees nationwide. So that's a lot, no? Um, Ron is the father of two lovely daughters, Zoe and uh, Chloe, both of whom who are, of course, always <laughs> interrupting daddy's work while serving as a source of inspiration. Uh, perhaps, no, well, I yata see si Zoe and Chloe as of the moment. So we might not be seeing the cute uh, two little kids uh, uh, today uh, jumping in the session as well. Okay, so let us start now. Before we uh, start with the official program, let's check first if uh, Mr. Ron Ona is around already. 
Ayan, Mr. Ron, magandang hapon. Can you hear us from there? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Jester, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. Bueno mano. And to everyone who's tuned in out there, stay safe and just stick with us for a few minutes, probably 30, 40 minutes, and let's have fun. Let's have some insights. And I'm happy to share my experiences for the past, di ko na ko ilang years. Right, right. Yeah, okay, of you. course, so this session is uh, not really informal, no? but it's more of a conversational. So, hindi kayo may inip dito. You will not also be seeing presentation slides here, huh? okay? So, mind you that uh, your listen, uh, your ears no, are, are very well, uh, very important in this session. That is why, no, kung meron kayong notes sa side nyo, uh, utilize it kasi maraming important uh, uh, insights and uh, experience is to share yung ating featured guest for today. Okay, so wag na natin patagalin pa, no? I'm sure they're very excited, especially with our um, topic for today, no? How to drive, no? Uh, employees no? as an expense, uh, transforming them from from being, again, an expense to a revenue drivers, okay? Now, for the... Uh, uh, the current situations no, uh, in this time of pandemic, um, um, organizations have began to, to downsize. No? Um, just like before when I was uh, in the, uh, the manufacturing uh, company, as I, as I have heard, no, from, from 15,000 employees, now they're down to 5,000 employees. So imagine the difference. Imagine the number that was cut uh, from, from, from the numbers from from the last time um, I was employed there. So that's a very big cut. And now some industries have even um, um, shut down the business because they cannot really adapt to the current situation. Since again, um, of course, the, in this time of pandemic, not not all industries can really adapt. And even, uh, um, let's call this fortunately, uh, some of the organizations have even thrived in this pandemic, most especially uh, anong sectors. no? Uh, yung mga ating pharmaceutical companies, they've tried because uh, of the vitamin Cs um, and yung ating mga medicines na ginagamit. Um, yung iba, let's say for example, in the hotel industries, they have changed their strategy. Uh, before, no, uh, of course, uh, the employees or the uh, people are not uh, using the uh, hotel now as, as form of leisure because of the threat of the uh, COVID-19. So what they did is... Uh, uh, other hospitals no, are, are now partnering with, with uh, local government units in helping them uh, accommodate, uh, um, you know, uh, patients with, with COVID-19. So because, uh, as you know, no, sa isang hospital sa San Fernando, uh, napuno na, no? And ang nangyari, tent na lang yung nangyari uh, sa, sa ground floor because the, the beds are full already. They cannot really accommodate the the uh, patients now and uh, as we all know from the news that we have watched uh, uh, probably from from gme7 or abs cbn uh, yesterday was again one of the highest number of cases that that we had in the philippines so it's really it's really um uh, it's really uh, challenging and it's really uh uh no the, the fear is is getting there no so now going back to the topic okay so, uh, Mr. Ron Ona um, will be sharing the, the uh, insights and concepts regarding the topic. Now, my question, John, is um, out of curiosity, you know, um, what made you realize um, that employees can not be only treated as an expense, but there can also be um, revenue drivers? Okay, thank you, Jester. Well, in our fast-changing world, I'm sure everyone knows that everyone is changing not only during the pandemic, but even before the pandemic. I don't think everyone should just be staying in their comfort zones, coming to work nine to five, doing their routines, and just being a company expense. Management and employees should be constantly working together in creating fresh ideas to help the business survive and grow further, especially during hard times. We cannot just say, oh, we're suffering during the pandemic. So management and employees should really think how can we go through this because i have to be honest in 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 europe in the uk we are shifting our business models from protecting ourselves from covid to actually living with covid because there's a large possibility that covid 
might be here to stay. So we must all learn how to protect ourselves, conduct our business, grow our business even even during this you know this this pandemic. And it's possible. We've been through several plagues, several pandemics before, world war, and people survive. The only way they survive is when they keep asking themselves, how can I be better than yesterday? And that is the kind of mentality you need to be a revenue driver of a company or any organization. I mean, if you can help grow the company, it only means your skills as an employee are growing as well. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to grow? Right, right. Uh, since especially most of the uh, non-HR leaders no, uh, has a misconception on, on uh, shared services group, of course, yung ating operations group, they're revenue drivers, especially the sales team. Uh, they, they expand our customer database no? and even they increase uh, the sales or revenue. But for non-HR professionals, no, um, they, they tag the uh, shared services group as an expense because uh, they just process uh, something out of uh, out of nothing. Uh, they're just uh, doing uh, some stuffs that uh, could help them. Um, uh, for example, uh, payroll no, or, or training development or recruitment and selection, which is not really revenue generating. Uh, that's a misconception of, of uh, uh, non-HR leaders. No? So now let's talk about uh, the framework. No? For, for some businesses, um, especially for some business leaders, it may sound uh, vague no? and impossible. Um, what if the What is the framework? Uh, you would like to introduce to transform employees from being a cost center to profit or uh, revenue drivers like a shared services group no apart from the operations group or the sales professional uh, the framework is largely best uh, based on the culture of uh, creating a culture of continuous improvement so let me just share a quick story like 68 years ago after the world war the americans left the jeepneys in the Philippines. And some enterprising guy named Sarau, he converted the jeepney into a public transportation. And 68 years ago, we still have the jeepney. But believe it or not, two years after Sarau converted that jeepney, the Koreans saw the Filipinos and they said, these Filipinos are so, so smart converting American junk into a public transportation. So, so they did the same. So they created what they call a Sibal. But the Sibal only existed for four years. And then what they did is they changed their automotive industry. And now they have Kia, they have Hyundai, they have Xiong. You know, the Korean automobile industry is so, they're now the third largest food automobile manufacturers. And here we are, we still have the Jeepney. And that is because we don't like to change or continuously improve. So we want, to introduce this culture across the organization, across the, the, the corporate sector. Right, especially, you know, pag sinabi natin change, it's, it's a very yeah. uh, challenging um, initiative, no? Because uh, dito sa changes na ito, uh, some organization leaders are very used to processes. That's why the resistance is very big, no? It's very hard to, to, uh, to, break, to break, no? Uh, and it's very challenging, especially for the uh, change management leaders. So from here, I hope that we get to learn from Mr. Ron Ona as to how we can um, create a buy-in, uh, not just for the, uh, uh, the leaders affected by this change, but also uh, from the uh, management who will be supporting this, this um, initiative. Now, uh, let's go deeper um, to, to the details no, of, of this framework. So now we're done talking about the framework. So let's not uh, let's now talk about how leaders can apply you now this framework or program to their organization. So, uh, para, para for the benefit of others, no? can you explain this program or, or framework in easy steps? Okay, thank you again, Jester. So this is uh, uh, around. How many years was that? But several years ago, in a town called Telford in the UK, it's roughly the size of Angeles City. We started working with HR 
leaders in the manufacturing and automotive construction and healthcare uh, sectors. And we launched this entrepreneurship program. So it's a program that transforms all employees from cost-centered overheads to a profit-driving human capital. So the idea is to empower all employees to go beyond their routines and contribute fresh ideas to improve the way they work and help grow the company and, of course, their careers in the process. Because, you know, Jester, if we just stay in our comfort zones, nothing will really grow. So here's a real-life example from one of our clients. So this guy, his name is Smith. Uh, he's a British guy. He's a machine operator. And he suggested an idea to improve production process from 12 steps down to eight steps. So he was able to save three hours daily. So in a year, three hours, that's 864, 864 hours. So if we equate that into money and into peso, that's a savings of 900,000 a year. So imagine if you have 300 employees doing the same, contributing fresh ideas, improvement and ideas. And what's amazing about this program is you don't have to push people to perform or do this. They, they do it on their own. Their intrinsic motivation drives them to create ideas. I mean, these people on the front lines, they know better than everyone else. They know better than the CEO. They have so many ideas. It just gets stuck there because of the bureaucracy, red tape, and you know, you've heard of the suggestion box before, which never really works. So you open them, uh, you get insects in there, you got rants, you got everything, but we want to bring this back, but on a different version, more digital and, uh, and, and more sustaining. So the re reality is people love succeeding, but if you don't give them the framework or the environment to succeed, you're going to lose that potential. So this entrepreneurship program is just in three easy steps. So it's, it's really very simple. So step one, since this is an HR-led initiative, it starts with HR. So HR should do their own housekeeping first. So HR must eliminate all those transactional admin burden that, you know, making them do overtime for 12 hours a day. So they can make more space for high value profit generating functions, or we, they call it strategic HR. I mean, helping the company save or make millions is better than four hours cutifying your Excel sheet reports, right? So, well, things that you can do to reduce your admin burden is first, the automate admin process using available software. They're everywhere now. Some of them are even free. And second is outsource recruitment, outsource comp ben, you know, outsource all this stuff, which are just routine. Let the experts do it you know, in, in the kind of quality that you want them to be performed. You don't have to burden yourself with this because you have better things to do, Mr. HR. And consider implementing a blended workforce strategy, say 30% of your direct employees have the core functions like your supervisors, line managers, and 70% of your employees can be contractual or can be freelancers. I mean, I'm talking about this is actually working abroad and I'm sure this will also work here. Now, in effect, HR have less people to worry about, but more space to, to, drive re to help these people drive revenue for the company. And also scrap traditional performance review, you know, the annual performance review, and consider coaching in the flow of work that fuels performance instead of just analyzing historical performance. And also scrap the traditional tra training. Don't stop people from working and force them to attend a classroom one size fits all training. And there are other options like consider self-directed personalized training. I mean, I know a lot of people who use their personal time to train themselves, and it works better than stopping work and trying to absorb all those information because self-directed personalized training, the next day they can actually implement what they've learned. So you, have, you now have a much leaner HR. You, Mr. HR have more space to think strategically. So the first, the step two is what we call top-down improvement. So this is where we ask top management 
the top management, hey, Mr. CEO, Mr. Uh, director for sales, director for marketing, director for operations, let's uh, uh, go together and, you know, you assemble all the department heads and you do a process walkthrough. I mean, when was the last time you guys sit in one room, maybe not during the pandemic, but, you know, talk together and say, let's look at our process, one, two, three, four, five, and let's, let's talk about what's wrong with it. I mean, a lot of companies rarely do this on, on a regular basis. They only do this when a problem came up or, you know, we lost money because of this and it's too late. So bring them in one room, in a virtual room, spread all the process, identify where are the faults, where do we need to correct it, and then collect ideas from everyone that will improve the business process. And I mean, from my experience, you'll be amazed how people can really pinch in their ideas. And then the CEO just kept saying, why didn't we talk of, uh, think of this before? So I, uh, I could tell you that you will generate hundreds, if not thousands of really good ideas that can help the company improve. Then the HR will compile all these ideas and he or she will work together with the CEO then you're going to filter all these ideas and implement ideas, those that have a bigger imp financial impact. So, because some ideas are just, you know, outright impossible to implement. Some are really great ideas, which can help the company save millions and even make more money in the process. So all these ideas will now become mini projects and the HR will be responsible for implementing this project from conception until uh, resolution. So don't worry about using Excel sheets because there is a software available to manage all these ideas, transform them into projects, and you can actually uh, work together with whoever had contributed this idea. And it's a collaborative software. Maybe in another time, I, I can uh, share this software with everyone. So now we've encouraged the management to become role models. Okay, I'm the CEO. This is what we this is what everybody needs to do. Let's think how we can improve the company or the business. So now it's time to go through the employees. I mean, everyone, security guard, janitor, secretaries, everyone. So this is like a suggestion box, except it's digital. So we will have a program where we encourage all employees to contribute improvement ideas on their level. So again, the HR will capture and compile them into the business improvement software. And you can. this is where you can actually account. In a year, you will see that this guy have contributed 20 ideas and it helped the company save 20 million pesos. Or this guy have contributed ideas, so it helped the company open a new business unit and it made us more money. We have to really capitalize on the ideas of the people. And I'm very sure all the employees have wonderful ideas that can be converted into, into, a, into a revenue for the company. When, when we talk about revenue, we don't just say sell, sell, sell. Revenue is about not cutting costs, but becoming more efficient. So like, the story I said earlier about the technician, if you can cut down your process, you improve your process, and you save so and so hours, it equates to money. So imagine what that can do for the company. So that's revenue in itself. So that technician in one year, he was able to produce 900,000 in savings for the company. So it's even better than a revenue because it's a cost that you help the company uh, it's a loss that you help the company avoid. So that's that's all the three simple steps, Jester. And right, going back to the, the uh, going back to the step one, as as, as I have recalled it correctly, um, you have mentioned that uh, HR now should uh, outsource transactional and admin functions like recruitment, compensation, uh, etc. Actually. Um, from from the employer of my friend, good friend in Singapore, 
no? uh, they actually have outsourced most of the the uh, functions of HR number one because um, we only use those functions at a certain uh, period of the year. Let's say, for example, uh, for the recruitment and selection, what they do is just uh, that they prepare you know, the the uh, the manpower they recruit no uh, employees for the uh, the coming year only when um, sometimes on the uh, uh, third quarter to fourth quarter or sometimes on the first and then second quarter. So after they have met the the uh, the list of employees already, uh, what are they going to do now? Uh, what what the uh, HR leaders do is that they yeah. do job rotation just to maximize the the time no that the the recruitment uh, uh, professionals spent in in doing stuff. So that of course we pay them on a monthly basis, but of course uh, there are times that we only need them on on some um, num uh, number of quarters. Uh, let's say also for compensation and benefits. Uh, sometimes uh, the compensation benefit is being done not just by a compensation and benefits officer, but sometimes this is being done by an accounting assistant where, where they input the, the the amount for the, the payroll. They, they will just only need the the, the time sheets no? so that they can they can uh, connect. I mean, to say uh, most of the compensation benefits doesn't really uh, um, do you no know, uh, stops on on a daily basis. That is why some organizations in Singapore, and I'm sure even outside uh, the Asian countries, they're outsourcing their their HR already. That is why um, in Manila and in in Clark, no, uh, HR consultancy has has um, begun to to uh, to arrive now because they wanted to to uh, help educate the uh, businesses, especially small businesses, that uh, they can just outsource their their HR functions. Also, uh, feel free to research about how you can outsource uh, your HR processes. Huh? Uh, as I also recall it correctly, um, Mr. Ron Onas has mentioned the, the uh, us no, checking the process. Let's say, for example, for, others, for other organizations, especially when we do value stream mapping, Value stream mapping is a method wherein uh, we outline the processes for each uh, for each uh, uh, things that we do. So there are phases. So from this phase, no, how many um, days or turnaround time can we adjust just to to shorten this period? That is why, um, uh, if you can recall it, even no, from the administration of Duterte, is is uh, he has. Uh, uh, Directed all government units not to adjust the the turnaround time of the processes to shorten it because um, as we all know we used to to uh, line up on on uh, a, uh, on the uh, LGU so arriving for example at 8 a.m. and then finishing up uh, at, at uh, let's say 4 p.m. Let me also share you my experience when I, I when I uh, uh, updated my driver's license so. When I went to the uh, uh, LTO uh, year, probably uh, 2000, uh, um, uh, 2009, no? uh, I went there as early as uh, as early as 5:30 a.m. so that uh, I can finish early. But imagine I finish my my driver's license not uh, at 11 a.m., not at 1 p.m., but at 6 p.m. just to to uh, get my driver's license. That's how slow the LGUs before, but now um, uh, the administration have adjusted the process of shortening, shortening it, the turnaround time. So that's like uh, what Mr. Ron Ona is, is, is saying. Uh, we all know that the process can be shortened. Ayan na, dito na tatamaan ibang organizations. Some organizations, uh, especially for the employees na umaalis na sa company, no, makukuha pa lang nila yung kanilang final pay kailan after three months, after four months, after five months, no. From a colleague of mine, I heard her say, no, when when I, I distributed the final pay, uh, pay, no, it only took me at least uh, uh, one week or probably less than one week, no. So why why uh, why prolong the period of, of uh, extending the final pay if the process is is merely there? So it's it's just that we need to check the processes, no. What are the the uh, the waste there that uh, that we need to to uh, remove, no? So from the value stream mapping, I suggest that uh, the leaders can can uh, 
reset how value stream mapping works because it it uh, it uh, removes no, the waste in the process and prioritize no, uh, improvement activities. So that is uh, a very good reminder for us, Mr. Ramona, to check the process no, and uh, not to prolong it anymore. Okay, so um, um, my, now my next question is, is this only applicable to a certain industry, like for example, just manufacturing industry, or is this... Uh, um, framework or program can this also be uh, uh, used no, by by BPO industries by uh, shared services industries or or non uh, manufacturing industries mr ron ona okay we i'm sure everyone is familiar with the saying there's always room for improvement and it never said room for just manufacturing or room for just healthcare in every business there are always ways to do things better than yesterday. Either you improve the process, you apply technology, or you learn new skills so to make things faster. So from our experience, it will work for all industries, even at your home. I mean, I, I do continuous improvement in my house. So like we fix stuff and we change stuff on, on a regular basis. So we, we cut back on expense, we become more efficient. So it works for everyone. It, it's a culture, it's not a method, but it's a culture of continuous improvement that we all need yesterday because we are going to face a different time in the near future. And it's always about change, change, change the way we do business, change the way we do our work. I mean, we've been there working wearing masks all these uh, safety protocols and there are more things that go into change not just the safety protocols so we have to have that culture of continuous improvement so we can always adapt to change right so that's uh, one way to to take a look at that no? it's not just a framework it's not just a process no but it's good that we apply it as a culture no? so that's a very that's good. good way to, to take a look at that no so we apply this process you know, as, as a culture. So again, no, as shared by Mr. Ron Ona, so this is actually a thinking, you know, a process from which we can apply this into any types of industries, not just uh, the examples given by Mr. Ron Ona from the manufacturing or healthcare setup, but this can also be uh, used in the industry. So so what can you advise, you know, especially for the, uh, for the uh, startup companies, you no? Know, who, who who is interested in, in using this this kind of of framework no? what will be the the best steps or uh, best uh, uh, beginning that, that that they can do to to implement this kind of framework okay usually when you run a business you're you're going to be busy with the day-to-day -day routines so what you are going to try to do either if you're an hr or a business owner is you're going to change the flat tire where the car is running. So you don't stop everyone and say, hey, let's all sit down. Let's see what's wrong with the company and don't go to work and stop your work. Let's talk for 20 hours and see what's wrong and how can we repair it. So that's why it's so difficult to do it. So this framework can be applied in the course of work. It doesn't have to be disrupt disruptive to, to the organization, but the owner, it starts from the top. The owner should be the role model and say, we should not be resting on our comfort zones. And the owner themselves, they should, you know, they should emulate that, that culture by becoming an example of a continuous improvement driver. Because I know a lot of CEOs who, who will say, let's just do the same thing over and over again because it works. And then the pandemic came so whatever works yesterday no longer works today so it has to start with the with the with the top executive that's why when we approach companies we first coach the executive and we show them the value in numbers how does continuous improvement work why do you need this in your business and if the top man does it people below him will, will certainly follow so top, top to bottom first. Okay. So 
the best way to approach um is that correct uh sir Ronana? yes start with the leader if the okay. leader says let's, let's course, go and so change things Yes, right, go ahead, right. So that's uh, one one uh, way to to implement that. If if no, the leader has, has supported um, your 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 um, initiatives. Now, can we help those organization leaders no, who has uh, a very small buy-in, no, sa, sa mga man, sa management? So um, can you help? No? Uh, of course, um, these concepts and ideas aren't enough. Most especially to the management if the management does not appreciate the concept or idea so how can you help the organization leaders no um, create a buy in for the management no uh, of course the management really loves data they love numbers no they, they don't don't really uh, much listen to employees who's just uh, blurting out um, concepts ideas of course the leaders especially the business owners wants numbers wants wants uh, uh, charts, no. So, how can you help the the uh, organization leaders wanting wanting to do this initiative? How can you help them create a buy-in for the management? Okay, precisely why HR is being labeled as overheads is because of the lack of numbers, the lack of data. So, one time, this is a true story. One time, one of my client in Dubai, he called me and say. Ronald, Ron, can you give me a list of all my employees? How much I'm paying them in terms of salary and you know vacation pay, perks and all? And on the last column, how much have they given me in return? So what is the return on investment on every employee, not just the sales, not just operations, but everyone? So I was not shocked. Where would I get this data? Because you won't get any return on investment on an employee when the employee is just doing his normal day-to-day -day routine. The employee must change the way they work. They must introduce fresh ideas to help the company grow. Like I said, nothing grows in comfort zones. So to get the buy-in, you just ask the uh, you just ask the leader. You know what's your return on investment on every employee you have? That guy, you're paying him 50000 How much are you getting in return? That guy, you're paying him 40000 How much are, is he giving in return? He can call the finance guy or the accountant for, all, for, for day in and day out. They won't get the numbers because the only way for people to become profit drivers is if they help the company grow with fresh ideas. You don't grow by doing the same thing over and over again. And that's what continuous improvement is all about, Esther. Okay. okay. So it's not just the, the proficiency, you know, it's better that we build a culture where uh, employees can bring in no, ideas. No? It's not just that they follow this this uh, job long mm -hmm. job description, so, but but them contributing even outside to the, the job description. That is why it's very important for employees as well to to do you no know, value adding. Um, initiatives to the organization so that's what we have to to check on no? the people that's why even some of the organizations have transitioned their uh, traditional job descriptions to be derivable oriented meaning to say that uh, uh, your job description uh, will will help you uh, uh, grasp so what are your deliverables you know it's up to you how you can uh, how you will uh, deliver through your through your methods so it's not just always the methods of of your boss now that is effective, but also there are a lot of ways uh, how employees can 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 deliver this output using their own methods. So All that's right. why organizations now have a transition from traditional job descriptions to to uh, you know deliverable oriented uh, or competency based you know, job descriptions. Some even uh, are not uh, so fun anymore of of uh, taking a look at their employees. So arriving there from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 8, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., they're more focused on uh, how much they, they deliver um, on a, a daily basis. So it's not just their attendance or them sitting on the chair, yeah, yeah. Even, even sitting them, looking at them, uh, doing overtime, 
but uh, in fact they can do the the workloads no uh, even for a very short time la so that's just another expense no um, um over time uh over time employees where they can do stops uh, on just a certain period um sometimes so uh, uh foreign nationals uh, tag uh, some no not all i'm i'm not uh, um I'm not talking about the general people, but some they tag the Filipinos as they have a very, very uh, lax no, uh, time. So they use a lot of time in in doing some some uh, majority of the time uh, coffee breaks, no, juicy uh, sessions, etc. But uh, they're not even productive. But others, no, they able to deliver the results on time, and then they do their extra subs after. Because others, now they do their extra stuffs now and then prioritize the workload later. But some, of course, the leaders are happy because uh, they're able to deliver. And then, of course, uh, you have the 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 time, no, to to uh, to relax. So uh, that's also one of the the uh, the reality here uh, for most of the organizations. Now, um, can you tell us more about this this? Uh, concept as to how you started this this uh, this uh, program um, how did this uh, program started have you observed um, a problem or challenge in your uh, organizations which uh, uh, pushed you to 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 implement this uh, idea okay as uh, as a mis or management information systems guy i used to design software so in order for you to design software you go to the ground and understand the process of the company so it turns out the lack of efficiency is always about people it's always about people i mean it's not technology that creates the business value it's always the people so the people are the one driving the process it's just the technology is just a tool so I shift from being an IT into a lean consultant. So whenever we visit companies, mostly the problem is, of course, the process. It needs to change. But the problem mostly is the people are not giving the right environment to really become more creative, change the way things work, improve the way things work. So we came up with this idea. OK, let, this is what we're going to do. Let's capitalize on everyone's ideas, put it somewhere, and the CEO will sit down, the finance guy will sit down, and we'll see which of these ideas have greater returns. So we prioritize them and then put them in our project plan, and then HR is going to implement it. I mean, why HR? Because HR is the only one who understands people better than the operations, sales, or you know, you know the, the, the marketing guys, because the operations, they cannot manage people. They only manage the output of the people. So once HR has gotten rid of the transactional, then they can become a transformational HR. So that's how we came up with this entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship means you're thinking like an entrepreneur while you are being an employee. I mean, I, I'm, I always see that the most successful employees is, are those who think like the owner. They don't think like the employee. They see a piece of paper being wasted on the copier machine. Oh, let's stop doing this because it's costing the company so and so thousands of pesos a year. So that's the culture that we want to promote in any in the organization. And HR is the best way. It's the best. Uh, it's the best department or the, the best. Uh, the best people who can make that happen. Not anyone else. Just HR. Right. No? So, catching up on the, the term that you have used, no? yung, yung lean HR. So, um, I, I'm sure uh, some of the viewers here um, have a working knowledge about the lean HR, but uh, to some of the organizations, the lean HR is, is very new to them. The lean thinking or it's most of um, the, the process of uh, waste reduction. So, can you tell more, uh, us more about the, the lean thinking? Uh, what is it all about? Is it just about um, waste reduction or is it just about um, adjusting our processes? Can you help the viewers uh, know more about the lean thinking? Okay, lean thinking starts with the lean manufacturing concept of 
basically or in simple terms making making things efficient so the only way to make things efficient is you trim down the process that you are doing that's why they they call it lean so you go to japan you go to sweden that's where you really experience uh, lean thinking so you decomplicate things you you must have this behavior where you always question yourself i'm doing this one two three four five how can i make it one two three so that's lean thinking you don't say oh we've been doing this for like 20 years and it works so why bother change it that's going against lean thinking and if you do that you become more efficient you'll grow you'll help the company grow you you'll help your career grow and i have not seen any lean thinker who have not been successful in his career or even his life so lean is i think or lean and continuous improvement it's a culture that everyone should be having in their organization as part of the strategy. Right. Okay. So in layman's term, not to to help the viewers, no. So lean is about uh, it's all about the elimination of waste. So no? let's say, for example, uh, lead time, shortening the lead time, uh, reducing the cost. No. Uh, the the lean. No. The goal of lean is to to. Uh, uh, deliver equality service no, on time, no, especially to our clients no, and uh, customer. Can you also talk about uh, the ways no, in, in the lean uh, so that uh, the, the viewers can also capture as to what are the ways in their processes no, so that uh, they can get uh, a very good example for the, the typical no, examples of uh, ways no, in their processes? Okay, there are eight forms of ways that we can you know, we can talk in detail but since we don't have the time the time waste to make it simple waste is something that you do and your customer is not paying you for for doing it so let's say you produce a goods uh, you produce a product let's say you produce a mouse so the customer is paying for the mouse but they're not paying for your transportation when you go home they're not paying for the mistakes that you've done i mean if I'm if I'm producing a mouse and I created a mistake and I broken one of the spare parts, the client is not going to pay for that. So lean thinking is about preventing that errors from happening. So a waste is everything that your customer will not be will not be paying. Right. Usually, if I if I can recall it correctly, no? uh, another type of waste apart from you uh, sharing the defects, no is uh, waiting, uh, of course, no? yeah, waiting wait. for anything or overproduction or, or any excess movement that is not really value adding uh, to the, the, uh, the, the output, no? um, as well as, as extra processing of stuff, just like uh, what the, the old uh, LGUs were, were doing, no? extra processing, as, as mentioned also by Mr. Ramon, and transportation no? or non-utilized talent, where our talents no, uh, has not been maximized to their full potential. No, it's like they're being placed no in a, a wrong role or position. That's why it's best to to check also our talent if if they're able to 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 uh, we're able to maximize their full potential. Else, no, the their their capability will be a waste. No, or what's worse is that uh, they will transfer from from your company to others because it seems like that uh, they were not uh, maximized by the organization so especially with the millennials no they they want challenging environment if they if they find the environment uh, very very simple or very boring they tend to they tend to move from from one work to another so it's best to check our talents no uh, and utilize the talents that uh, they're not just good for for uh, Let's say, for example, for recruitment and selection, but uh, they're also good as, as uh, employee engagement officers where they usually host programs, etc. So that's one way of utilizing other talent. No? So checking also inventory, you know, just like an example of, of uh, a store, I will, not, I will not mention the name. They always tend to, to have excess stock, no? especially this food store. You know? for, for this excess stock, what they do is just... Uh, they they sell the excess goods no on at a fifty percent off na lang. 
So that's a very huge waste of money, no? um, overproduction or excess stock. No? So of course we have to we have to have a foresight. That's why it's good to have no no um, uh, a thinking where um, how much no is really needed. And this is being supported not just by haka haka or assumptions, but by of course data. So it's best that HR no should be data driven. Uh, that is uh, one of the the advantages of of uh, applying the method of what Mr. Ron on uh, is talking about. Ayan, sige. So uh, let me also browse through the comments now before in, um, the session. So if you have any questions for Mr. Ron on uh, re uh, relevant to the topic, now feel free to reach out, especially for for your um, ma uh, questions or confusions, no. Uh, if this is the first time that you hear about um, HR and lean no, combination, no, feel free to, to reach out and uh, Mr. Ronona will help out uh, clarify these things to you as to how we can um, transform employees no, from um, as an expense to revenue drivers. No? It's just not the, the sales who are revenue drivers, but as well as the right. non-sales no, employees by trimming down no, the fats or trimming down the the ways or processes so uh, efficiency okay. so of course effectiveness and of course quality uh, standards so as shared by mr um Cy Claire here uh, so many accessible and in, inexpensive lean six sigma programs there recommend hr practitioners to take ayan. so like me for example i am a certified lean six sigma yellow belt uh, so this is a very good opportunity to to implement that thinking you know, that lean thinking to our process not just for the manufacturing industries as shared by mr ron ona yeah so please now utilize our comment sections for questions no huh? so um we'll wait for your questions so before that now let me uh, uh check who our viewers today so we have miss Gio junisha here watching us today miss may musni Ms. Rosa May Bagos, no? uh, Ms. Catherine Dinglasa, and others. So, uh, any more thoughts or insights that you would like to share no, or to impart no, to, to the viewers, especially uh, through this big leap no? of, 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 uh, of uh, big leap no, to, to uh, the, the organization? So, um, do you have any suggestions, insights, or even um, guidance no, as to how they can best uh, do this. Okay. When the pandemic happened, we went back to our clients and it became obvious that organizations who have this culture of continuous improvements are the ones who have survived and even thrived during the pandemic. And at the same time, they are telling us while we're doing this entrepreneurship program, we have addressed the classic HR challenges like employee engagement, employee turnover, performance management, and training ROI. So all these problems that we used to have, almost automatically it has been resolved by the entrepreneurship program that it's not about just changing processes. It actually resolved all the HR problems that they used to have for decades and if not uh, centuries. And of course, change will not happen overnight. By nature, people will always resist change. It's it's an instinct. People don't people will find change or new new territory as a danger to them. But you have to start somewhere, and you start uh, the, the the time is to start now. And what we realize is that technology is a good enabler. Remember, in the past, in the eighties, that you know, nobody eats breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and takes photos of their food. Now, when the mobile phones came, the digital camera, it changed the culture of the people. And it's the same thing with the culture of continuous improvement. If you use technology to manage and influence people to adopt a culture of continuous improvement, it will definitely work. And we are facing tougher times ahead. I, I'm not being a rumor monger or you know, this is not a scare tactics because the science tells us that we are COVID-19 is an RNA, whatever that means, but it's an RNA virus that is similar to 
the common cold and the uh, influenza. And we still have not developed the influenza vaccine or common uh, common cold vaccine, and it always mutates. So we have to learn to live with this. So the game plan now is not to vaccinate, but the game plan is just to live with the virus, protect ourselves, and we know it's it's going to work. It, we've seen it working work in Europe, and it's definitely work elsewhere. And the HR role is to ensure that its human capital is ready for the future. The CEO won't go anywhere. He won't go to the sales guy, to the operations guy, and ask, hey, protect my people. I mean, help my people survive during these trying times. That's not the job of the operations, sales, or finance, or it's always the HR who is really the winner of this game. Okay, thank you for that uh, reminder, uh, Mr. Ron Oda. No? So that ends our uh, pilot episode for, for today, no? for the uh, HR on the go session. So uh, again, we would like to thank Mr. Ron Oda for extending your time no? and sharing your insights no? to our viewers. No? So with that, now we know better that people are not just an expense, no? uh, are not just an expense, most especially the shared services group but they also represent no and present a very valuable asset um that of course no represent future uh, results of the company your people no, are very important resource that needs to be led properly no, to maximize performance and generate revenue no? so while we know that it's vital to understand their um, their um, well at their the, the team they're at their best of course uh, when they're loved appreciated respected and engaged and acknowledged of course it's also vital that we apply this framework no? so that uh, we're able to to maximize no uh, the the uh, the uh, the waste no from from the processes that we have created no trimming down the okay so again this is a uh, on the go it's a joint collaboration of Clark HR Council and certified uh, profession uh, practitioner in the HR uh, professional no? airing live on the CHRC Facebook page every second you now and fourth Tuesday monthly so um, if you are interested to be featured, uh, email go at clarkhrcouncil.org or for those who are yet members in the uh, Clark area, if you're interested in HRC member, you know, join us so via www.clarkhrcouncil.org slash join. You know? Feel free to visit our website so that you're able to, to get to know more about the uh, uh, the Clark HR Council, no, who, it, uh, who is Clark HR Council, or, or, uh, who it, uh, it uh, represents. No? So again, w.org. No? So thank you again, everyone, and I hope that you are all safe and well. Guys, be safe. Uh, be safe. Take your vitamins and sleep early. So again, this is just... Uh, HR on the go, and uh, we hope to see you soon huh? next uh, Tuesday. Dito sa, sa fourth month ng ating uh, buwan ngayon. Ayan, paalam po sa inyo, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.
The Philippines is being called Asia's rising tiger. But what exactly does this mean? Posting a GDP growth of 6.7% in 2017, the country has one of the fastest growing economies in the world, expanding at a rate unseen in the last five decades. The good news is, it's just getting started. The better news is, that we have designed a brand new city to be the nucleus of this economic renaissance. Less than one hour from the capital of Manila, straddled by hills and blessed with tropical climate all year long. We are building the city of the future, a landmark development twice the size of Manhattan. Originally developed by the Americans for its secure and strategic location in Asia Pacific, Clark is being transformed into a disaster resilient metropolis that will be competitive and attractive to a global market. It will consist of four main districts, the Clark Freeport Zone, an existing mixed-use complex established in the 90s. Clark Global City, which will serve as the primary business district. And New Clark City, which will house satellite government offices and a first-class sports village. Central to all of this is Clark International Airport, which will soon be expanded to accommodate up to 80 million passengers a year. This ensures that travel will be comfortable while trade is seamless. A city unmatched in connectivity with access to world-class highways and the service of high-speed railways connecting north to south and east to west across surrounding seas and over oceans. Clark is a city built as living proof that business in this part of the world is not only easy, but simply better. With no red tape, lower taxes, and endless investment opportunities. This is a city prepared to attract talent so that the country's best and brightest will come here to work and choose to call this place home because this is a city that knows how to play, where you can unwind at your own speed, where safety is paramount, and people always come first. This is a city where history and culture thrive, where modern conveniences meet timeless traditions, and progress is driven by passion. This is a city with limitless ambition that may someday find itself among the great cities of the world, built for business so that time is always well spent and built for people so that life is always well lived. This is Clark.